morning again. So we have uh, amazing panelists here. Uh, just uh, a brief note, Katina Stefanova was not able to come on time. Um, she was stuck in the office, so we will have uh, we will have Claire Chang of Mary Mac Family Office uh, speaking this panel. So this panel is actually, I would say, um, kind of futuristic, machine learning and AI investing. And uh, we will be <laughs> discussing uh, very open-ended questions. And the first question would be, what is AI in uh, investment world? So maybe Jessica, you like to take a little brief sure. note can, on that yeah, for a few minutes, and then we'll go across. So I don't know how many of you were here yesterday, but there were a lot of really interesting discussions that wandered into um, the AI and machine learning space that I thought were, were excellent. And uh, one of the gentlemen on the panel last, last night gave what I think is a nice definition that's sort of sweeping, which is when a computer does something that you'd normally expect a person to be able to do. Um, and to me, that's sort of the important way to think about what does someone in the public expect when you say AI. And then I think it's also really easy to then to sort of devolve into the more sort of discussions of like, well, is it is it deep learning, like statistics isn't it, this is you know, this isn't it, this isn't it. And in my view, sort of as long as you know what you're doing and you can separate out the marketing terms from the actual work that you're doing, um, that's really what's important. Uh, so sort of not drinking your own Kool-Aid. Um, so my definition is, is usually when people think, I would think a person would have needed to do that, but you've been able to get a computer to do it, you know, then you, you might want to you might be able to call that AI if you want to stretch. Okay, thank you. And Paul? Uh, it's a very interesting concept, AI. There's a lot of science fiction movies about it. Um, in practice, though, um, I personally primarily see it as uh, an evolution of the toolbox of a quantitative researcher. It's moving beyond the traditional linear regression, even though in some really, uh, really narrow sense, you could see that as a form of AI too, uh, moving towards non-parametric, non-linear, uh, multi-dimensional methods that are stronger in terms of handling uh, conditional logic, multi-layered uh, logic, and better at handling correlated predictors, these kinds of things. Moving, moving towards non-linear methods that are uh, more adaptive. That would be sort of the, the, the quants angle on what, what is okay, AI in okay. investments. Great, nice. Uh, we're getting Clark from your uh, family office slash investing point of view. So I, I think a lot of machine learning and AI is is marking hype. I don't think it's necessarily real. People have been doing it forever, but people talk about it as if they're doing something special and different now. So look, there's systematic and quantitative strategies. You can do it within macro, or you can do it within like stat arb and stuff. And they're trying to make predictions based on narratives. So we think momentum is going to continue over the last three days, whatever. So we're going to create a model that predicts that with a regression. It could be linear, or it doesn't have to be linear. But that's more of the narrative. That's the old school systematic quant strategies. AI machine learning are models that are created by the, by the machines themselves, where they're looking at data, and they're trying to figure out a pattern, and then tr trying to create a model from that. And the reason machine learning and AI has come about now is because computing power has increased significantly over the last few years. And then most of the data in this world has been created over the last few years. So without data, you can't teach a computer to create a model. And because that data has been coming in between all these sensors, every, all the alternative data that's out there, people are trying to create AI machine learning models out there. And um, I think that's something new. Now, whether it works or not is, you know, we could talk about later. Personally, I don't think most of it works, actually. But we could talk about that later. I like the, uh, the fact that you mentioned it's a hype. So we would like to take a little uh, consensus here from uh, zero to 100. 100 meaning uh, it's, it's real and zero is a hype. So after Pank uh, makes uh, his definition of uh, AI. Yeah, so AI, I think, you know, two levels, maybe on the more technical level, when you talk about AI, maybe people think about, okay, like a deep learning neural network, and I would just characterize as kind of a, you know, massive nonlinear regressions. It's like, you know, every neuron is a regression, and you have, you know, could have 100 neurons and 10 layers, and all of a sudden you have, like, you know, 10,000 regressions going on. So, you know, maybe on the technical level, that's the case, and I would say on the non-technical level, it's... You know, whereas before, for the last uh, 30 or 40 years in quantitative investments, we've always had to kind of involve human intervention most of the time. But now I think, you know, we've evolved to a stage where computational power and data availability is such that we can let kind of, you know, machine to make its own decisions. So I, I guess, you know, that's how, you know, I would characterize, you know, an AI in investments. So starting from you, uh, Peng, so from zero to 100, 
hype reality? I would say it's probably a 75, you know, definitely, I mean, well, 75 in the sense that, okay, it, it's definitely useful and it's here to stay, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're going from, you know, let's look at the toolbox we use up to now, maybe just linear regressions, which, you know, has been around for, you know, 100, 200 years, or, you know, Markowitz mean variance optimization, you know, it was created in the 1950s, but now we are really getting into the more nonlinear, more sophisticated, you know, portfolio optimization of forecasting techniques. So, you know, it's definitely here to stay, it's long overdue, but at the same time, you know, when you think about, okay, what Google has done, you know, or, uh, you know, Facebook automated driving, or, you know, playing chess or Go, um, those kind of things are not exactly in the same realm as um, investments. So, you know, I don't think that, you know, you can just look at okay, the, the developments over there and say, okay, they've beaten the best chess player, the Go player, and here, you know, an AI-driven hedge fund will beat, you know, the best uh, human hedge funds. Clark, from zero to 100? I, I put it around 20%. I, I, don't, I, I really, I've seen a lot of machine learning AI funds over the last few years, and they all have phenomenal back tests. I think they look great. None of them actually work in real life, though. <laughs> like, they're not good at predicting. Because the thing is, it, it may be overfitting the data. And the, the problem with machine learning is when you, when you talk to machine learning fund is like, you know, how does the model work? You know, what happens with risk? What happens in this scenario? Like, no one can describe what happens because they don't know. Because the machine figured it out. The answer is always the machine figures it out. Like, when do you turn off the machine if it's not working, if it's losing money? Well, the machine will figure it out. The, the problem is you don't have a narrative. You don't know why it, the model works in the first place such that you don't know when to turn it off. If you don't turn off a quantitative model that is maybe broken, you could lose all your money before you turn it off. The, um, now, with any quant model, it doesn't matter if it's not scalable. So if, if you have a quant model that gives you great returns but can only manage $10 million, it's great for you to manage your own money, but if you can't scale it to 100 million to a billion, it's not a business. So the, the problem with the quant is trying to trying to come up with models that are predictive that can make you money, but you can also scale to build a business with. And I don't, I haven't seen it yet. There's one fund I know that does work though. Interesting. So uh, we're 50 now, 50 percent, okay. 75 and 20. Paul, well, so you were 20. Okay, I, I agree with a lot of the things you said. That there are a lot of reasons to be skeptical. The interesting thing is we, we actually had an AI expo at New York Life uh, a, few, uh, a few months ago, uh, but we asked this question, this survey question, from a zero to 100. The average in that survey came out as 64. Uh, so mo most people were leaning in the direction of this being more real than not. I would personally agree it's probably, it's probably some, somewhere in that vicinity. It's above 50, but... Uh, I wouldn't go all the way to, to 75. I, I'll echo some of the things that have been said, some of the, the skepticism. I, I think the biggest concerns, especially when you look at it from a global macro position taker, is that the power of these next generation methods really is in the ability to handle a large number of predictors at the same time. That's incredibly powerful if you're Google and you have 4 million searches uh, per minute, if you're Uber and you have 10,000 drives and, and, and you're trying to optimize, you're trying to learn from all those relevant examples. But when you're doing macro investing, you just don't have that many examples. And we run into what we call the curse of dimensionality. Um, as the number of parameters and predictors grows, um, they may grow linearly, but the need for data grows exponentially. And you, you are inherently going to face models where the out, output is going to be going to be unstable and you might overfit uh, on the historical data and the back tests will always look better than reality. Still, all of that said, I, I totally agree with all of that. I, I still think there are some really new and important innovations here that can enable quantitative research team and portfolio management teams uh, to utilize their time much better, better screening tools in, in picking out, um, figuring out what, what's the signal from the noise. Okay, so you're basically on 60 or something, right? Yeah, that's Similar to your firm, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And what about you, Jessica? So I think for me, it's tough to give one number across. The two dimensions that I think of being really important are sort of what's your time scale of your investment horizon is one. And if it's really, really short, I think you actually can kind of automate decision making. And I think where machine learning and AI is going to first work is in, you know, sort of execution algo and really, really short term. Because there you're not, you don't have people competing against people anyway. You have sort of like bots competing against other bots. So one thing is I think the shorter your time scale is, the sooner you'll be able to use these technologies. Um, and and I, that sort of ties to the second thing, which is where in the value stack are we talking about? So is it AI or machine learning for time series prediction, which I think is, I've never seen that work yet. 
cut um, over any meaningful time scale. I think if you want to get it really, really short, you can basically say, well, here I'm pattern matching. I can sort of create something that'll keep pattern matching and that might work in the short term. Um, so I think if, you know, so I think it's very, very difficult to see it. Like I, I place it like a 5% that in our, you know, the next five years, you'll see real long-term decision-making entirely driven by ML and AI. Um, but where else in the value stack is it? Can you screen through, you know, lots of documents better with machine learning and pattern matching techniques than you could with a human? Definitely, and people are already doing that. So to me, if you sort of parse out and say, well, is there a spot in the value chain where it's useful? Yes. And is there a time horizon where it's much more effective than others? Yes. But where, you know, many of us may think of playing in a little bit of longer time scales where there is capacity, there I have sort of the lowest confidence, unfortunately, um, that it's going to be impactful in the short term. Thank you. Uh, so in terms of investment management process, uh, there is a due diligence, then analysis, there's a portfolio construction, there is a portfolio optimization. Uh, which part of this investment management process, again, from, I don't want to say from zero to 100, but which, which parts from uh, the easiest to the most difficult um, is where AI is going to take a hold in investment management process? I mean, I'll just sort of, just, this is kind of what I was just saying, but I see a lot of potential value in sort of process um, and efficiency gains at like the data collection layer. So to me, that's where we're first gonna see it. And the, the closer you get to, you know, what's the form of the strategy looking like and can you basically learn a strategy from whole cloth? A bunch of funds have said they've done that and I haven't seen it work. Um, so I think to me, the sort of base kind of data collection and organization layer is the most compelling one that I know about and have seen work. Sure, sure, I agree. Uh, now, if you can, we can continue and uh, get your thoughts I'll, on I'll the add. same question, but I'd like to also include, once you answer this question, what are the challenges and how can we overcome those challenges? Obviously, uh, I, would, I would add monitoring and screening, uh, that part of the investment process can be very time consuming. There are some surveys CFA in New York did uh, some months ago, showing that it's only at this point 10% of all analysts in the industry that have experimented and tried to implement uh, machine learning uh, types of techniques. There's still a lot of spreadsheets going on, and I love spreadsheets, there's nothing wrong with Excel, uh, but a lot of the processing uh, of a large range of cyclical data, specific industry specific data, screening which companies are at an elevated risk of facing significant events such as being taken over. If you want to short a company and it, it gets, if there's a buyout, you could be in trouble. Uh, having tools that enable you to screen large amounts of data and highlight which ones needs closer attention, kind of like Airbnb is looking for fraudulent transaction in, in the same way. That's where, that's where there's a lot of, a lot of low hanging fruits. You've also mentioned uh, some of the some of the pitfalls. Uh, I mean, definitely, challenges. the challenges, challenges the challenges in, in in making it work is that the time series aspect um, of it is fraught with a lot of challenges. Uh, someone with a background in econometrics, uh, we know time series um, can be non-stationary. Um, it's hard to distinguish between causation and correlation. You might think that people on the beach are getting a tan because they're eating ice cream. Just by observing in that way, you might think that um, whether it's the NFC or the AFC that wins the Super Bowl that can predict the stock market, well, that's a correlation, but those are likely not causation. Um, even worse, uh, we have issues distinguishing between the cause and effect when the relationship is essentially two-way. Like, is the Fed's expansion of the money supply, which happened uh, during the crisis, uh, was that an impulse to the market or was that a response to what happened in the market? And the danger, the big danger here is that if we use more sophisticated, more black boxy, uh, more nonlinear methods uh, to analyze those things, we don't really fully understand what's going on inside and these traditional problems of identifying cause and effect might in fact be swept under the carpet and you could actually end up with a model that even though it was very sophisticated and, and sounded very smart, that would spit out complete nonsense. That is, that is a real risk. Yep. Clark, from your, your point of view. So at, at a high level, when you look at strategic asset allocation, tactical asset allocation, those are very long-term trends and stuff. AI machine learning is not useful for that. First of all, your data is going to come quarterly instead of you know, daily or even minutes. 
And without data, you, the machine learning model does not have enough data to learn to, just, to kind of describe the pattern and come up with the model. The, plus, if you had a machine learning model that was telling you the strategic asset allocation every day, you're not, you're not changing your asset strategic asset allocation every day, nor are you changing your tactical asset allocation any, every day either. It's more useful, I think, in terms of actually trading securities and investing and stuff. But, but from that perspective, like, you need a couple of pieces to create a successful quant business. You, you need, a, you need a, um, a trading cost model, and you need data to figure out what your trading costs are, because it doesn't matter if your alpha is gonna be whatever percent, but your trading costs are more than that. You need a, uh, you need a risk model. Technically, you don't wanna use something that's out there, because if it's already out there, you're not gonna get any alpha from your risk model, so you come up with your own risk model. You need an optimization model, I mean, there's some holy grails to optimization, such as multi-timerized optimization or factor timing models, but only the biggest, biggest quant funds out there, like Two Sigma, D, Shell, Renaissance, have solved those problems. Most people have not solved those problems. They have estimations of it, but they haven't solved it. And the last piece is gonna be the, um, is gonna be the return forecast models. Now, AI machine learning may be useful in forecasting out returns, but you're missing the other pieces, which may be why a lot of these, um, these machine learning funds are failing because they have one piece of it, which is forecasting the return, but they don't have the risk model, the trading cost model, nor the optimization model. Likewise, there are funds out there that are, um, they have phenomenal data. So there's a fund called Cargo Metrics out there. This guy's like, like Quantopia, they're trying to do something different. They have one piece of it, which is they have data to forecast returns, but they don't have the other pieces. What they should do is just sell that data to Two Sigma, D, Shaw, or Renaissance. The, um, now, now, the biggest problem with all of machine learning AI is data. And it's not just the amount of data, it's the history of data. You need enough history. So, so like, in our business, what we're trying to avoid is skew. So, you, it doesn't matter if you're making 10% a year, if you're gonna lose 50% in one year. You're trying to avoid skew. Skew only happens once every 10 years in a, in a financial crisis or some kind of huge risk off scenario. But you need data going back multiple cycles. Machine learning data, alternative data hasn't been around long enough. It's all been accumulated over the last few years. So you don't know what's gonna happen in the next crisis, whether these machine learning models will actually work. The, the second thing with data besides history is the quality of the data. And people are taking data everywhere, but the quality of the data is so important because if the data is not good, the inputs are not good, the model is completely worthless. Like you, you have to clean the data. And if you, if you go visit Renaissance, um, and there's a great book about Renaissance too that just came out this week if, if you guys want to read it. I just downloaded it on Audible. But if you go visit Renaissance, like a third of the team there, all they do is clean data. These are PhDs and all they do is clean data. Because if your data's not clean, if it's not good, it's useless. If you look at someone like Two Sigma, so, so these quant guys, the, the big guys, have been, have been downloading data, scraping data every day and they timestamp it for the last you know, 20 years. Reuters is giving out data to these guys, they're selling it, but they correct their errors. So there's errors in the data, they correct them over time. They, they basically correct them over the, um, over the database. The problem with anyone buying that data is that it's not the data that people traded on in the markets at that time, it's corrected data in hindsight. So the only guys who have that actual data from history are the big guys who've stored it and time stamped it over that time period. I think in some cases Reuters has actually asked these big guys, can we buy the data back with the errors? and they won't sell it back to them. But data and quality of data, history data is extremely important for AI and machine learning. And I don't think for new guys out there, they have that, they have those resources and that data set to, to do this work it's on. Very, very good. Thank you so much for, for this insight. Now, we, we do have uh, big guys here in the, in, on this panel. Um, Bank, JP Morgan, I cannot be bigger than that. Big elephant in the room, right? It's a big so, company, but I'm not a big guy. <laughs> uh, you're very modest because you're Chinese. That's okay. Okay. Uh, we have some Chinese here working with us, right? She's going to tell me, oh my God, what you, how can you say that? Anyway, uh, so um, it's, if you can tell us, how do you overcome these challenges at JP Morgan? You have an amazing team there. Thanks. So, I mean, I would say I kind of slightly disagree with what, what Clark just said. I think if you look at I like that, that's good. <laughs> kind of that cycle of the trade, right? First is like a signal generation, okay? Number two is portfolio optimization. Number three is basically trade execution. I would say that of these three stages, uh, trade execution is um, kind of, you know, the easiest place for machine learning to be implemented, as Jess just, just said. And then portfolio optimization, I think there's a lot of potential there as well, because even look at you know, the state-of-the-art borrower model, for example, it's still based on mean variance optimization or like risk parity. It even kind of reduces you know, the return dimension only focuses on the standard deviation or the correlations. But you know, there are so many things 
that you know, we can take into account within this portfolio optimization space where we can take into account higher moments, cold skewness, uh, you know, kurtosis, et cetera, et cetera, which you know, can all be accommodated within the machine learning framework. And at the end of the day, you know, machine learning and AI problems are optimization problems, okay? So like um, over there, I think there's a lot of room for uh, alpha generation, okay? Now, when it comes to signal uh, discovery, I would say actually that is probably the most difficult part for you know, AI to come in because the noise is so big in the financial data, you know, the signal to noise ratio is so low, you know, whereas let's say if you look at, you know, what Uber is doing, what Google is doing, they probably expect a hit ratio of something like 95% on their NLP algo or our, their automated dri driving algo or, you know, like, to be honest, in your auto automated driving, you cannot have a hit ratio of 95%, right? It has to be 99.9%, .9%, you know, or more. But for us, if we can get a hit ratio of 55%, we're, we will already be very ecstatic about our algorithm. So I would say that that's probably where the challenge comes from. You know, so, so I would say that for us right now, the focus is more on the portfolio optimization part and the execution part. And in terms of signal generation, you know, like I, I would look at it as a kind of greenfield project. You know, if we can get, find something that works great, if not, you know, no worries. Why? Because, you know, you talked about time series forecasting, right, where, you know, machine learning doesn't really work. But the fact is no algorithm, no economic or statistic method has done well in time series forecasting, whether it's Arima or Garch, whatever, you know, like, so if even machine learning can improve it on it a little bit, I think that's already value added and, you know, it, it merits, uh, you know, attention and uh, investments. I think you answered uh, part of my uh, next question, which is what are some um, uh, use cases where, you know, you as a, as, as a uh, team leader in your past uh, firm, Quintompian or Fidelity now, uh, you've been working on some projects that I'm sure, you know, not all projects are going to be, you know, 100% okay, right? So sometimes you just say, well, we're wrong, you know, we'll go back to the drawing book and let's try something else. So there, what, what are some pitfalls that you have encountered, both the current firm and the, and the previous firm? If you yes. can share with the audience, what are some things that you work for, you know, I mean, months and then they say, well, this is not really going to work. That is true of every project. I mean, so once in a while, like a rare counter occurrence that you often can't later prove was different than luck, you get something really working. Uh, so it was funny to hear you mentioning Quantopian. So I was there up until this summer. Um, so Quantopian, if you're not familiar with it, uh, is basically, it's not really an AI slash ML company. Now we, were, we did a couple things we we're trying to use that. I'll talk a little bit about them because I think they're interesting. It's actually kind of going this other direction, right? So on one hand, you can say, you know, is machine learning or AI good at sort of pretending you have an army of people brute forcing a problem that could be done slowly, like reading every accounting statement? Well, Quantopian is sort of like, hey, people of the internet, let's crowdsource and actually let humans try to solve this problem in, in any different way. Now, both have that same problem of you can basically get overfit. So Quantopian, we would have, you know, millions of strategies people had designed, and we wanted to try to find some efficient way to search through them and find predictive algorithms. Um, and so we looked at some machine learning techniques to try to do that. It was very challenging. Um, the place that I think we made the most progress was once we had used traditional techniques to select what we thought sort of the best 1% of algorithms was. And it, it's sort of one of those things where it's pretty easy to discard like the bottom 80% of algorithms, right? So they're just either not trading enough securities, right? It's like a really big search space. So once you sort of get the categorical non-predictive things and, and you pick a, a set of strategies, we, we would do that and then say, can we use machine learning to learn an online update how we would weight these signals? So imagine we had then picked from the crowd and we would have like 30 or 50 or 100 signals. How should we weight those over time and can we learn and update those weights? And it, it looked pretty interesting. We made some good progress. Um, what was always the most painful moment was when you'd say, okay, great, this looks kind of promising. What percent improvement is it over? some benchmark. So what would be a reasonable benchmark? I always like equal weight. Right? So what percent improvement does this smart online learning weight update you, you know, get you over equal weight? Borderline, whether it's statistically significant. So I think that's another interesting thing, um, which Peng, you mentioned, is sort of, you don't have to have a, it doesn't have to be a perfect solution, but you do always want to keep in mind, what is the improvement that I'm getting 
over a simple solution and does it pay for the complexity that I'm adding into my process? So like the, you know, complexity has a lot of hidden costs, non-interpretability, the probability that you are overfit, the probability that you're doing something that you're, you know, you're, there's something in there that you're missing. So that's one challenge that I've always seen is you really want to use these techniques, you want to be pushing things forward, but if you're really honest with yourself about what that benchmark of sort of the next simplest thing is, it's tricky often to convince yourself this, um, this a cost in complexity that I'm taking on is paid for. Um, so that's an example, you know, of something where I, th I saw promising, but it was really challenging to prove that it was worth it, I think. What happened to Numeri? Was it Numeri? That was the Numeri. What happened to those guys? I think they are think still, so Numeri, yeah, so, so, so at Quantopian, we hosted all the code. So you, person of the internet, would come on our platform. That was not, was cool about that. One of the, open source, so people know. Well, so we, all, all our backtesting stuff is open sourced, um, but when you come on the platform and write an algorithm, it's not by default open source. Private to you, you can choose to publish it and share the source code, and we make that really easy for people to collaborate. So your, your code, we don't look at it as was stored encrypted, but we have it. Right? So we can then go back later and say, hey, let's override your backtest settings and run our own investigation. And that's how we did all our research. So your code is an object that I've got. Numeri is different. They operated more like Kaggle. So data scientists out in the world, I'm going to give you a you know, hashed set of data. You don't know what it is. You're going to run a prediction model, and then you're going to give me the answers. Now, I don't have any of the models. I can't like check that later, and I don't know you'll show up tomorrow to give me the uh, predictions. Um, so that was what I thought was the biggest challenge. Now, I don't actually know where they are now with running a fund or how, how it's going. I didn't know if they were still around or not. But, but you know what's interesting about Numeri and, and uh, Quantopia is that they're doing something different in this world, which, is, which I think you need to do. But when, when you look at some of the successful quant guys in this business, I mean, the guys who, who, who have a machine learning model, which I think does great, and annualizes like 30% a year, they're not, they're not finance guys, they're all coders. And then if you look at the Renaissance guys, those, none of them are finance guys. And I, I've seen them for like 15 years, and I, I, I can't wait to read the rest of the book. But like, they don't, they're not finance guys either. They're all PhDs. But the best guys at Renaissance are astronomers. Because astronomers are good at looking at data with holes in it. And when you look at financial data, the data is not perfect, which is what I talk about quality. Like, they can look at data with holes in it and, and try to piece that together to come up with a predictive model. So you would never suspect that if you're majoring in astronomy out of college, you could actually become a billionaire running money at Renaissance. But, but I think it's, it's to your point that the challenge, and this is what I felt at Quantopian, and I think Numeri has it, so you need an area where you're differentiated and doing something new, but then you need all the rest of the stack. So I think the guys that have that make it work and make money off it, it's just like I will offline, I can tell you what I think about <laughs> how, what Quantopian should do next, but is that you've got that one piece, but you have to have, you know, the execution, you have to have the risk modeling, you have to, and we, you know, we said to ourselves, oh, let's build our own risk model, which fine, okay. We didn't know, really know how to do that. We built a reasonable risk model, we open sourced it. Later, we went back and said, geez, maybe we should have just focused on just this alpha generation piece, and you know, gone and sort of done traditional for the rest of the value chain. So I think that's the thing is those astronomers on their own won't be running, you know, a $2 billion fund, but pair them with the right people that understand the industry and slot them into that alpha generation spot and you can do something really powerful. Right. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, Paul, uh, from a multi-strategy slash multi-class uh, point of view, what are some pitfalls that you've been uh, encountering and how you mitigate this? When you think you're wrong, and what do you do about well, it? Well, definitely, model interpretability is a huge issue, and the quest for interpretable AI, interpretable machine learning is, is ongoing. That's where the key to success is. But the problem is, if you have a model, even if it has reasonable predictive power, um, we develop a model for credit spreads, um, and we were very happy with it because it looked like it was really, we did the cross validation and did it all due diligence on it and it looked really good. And also it's live performance for actually pretty good. But we found that we worked in a cross-functional team and uh, worked on projects and we're trying to encourage um, portfolio managers on corporate bonds to also use it. And we weren't successful, obviously. Um, in fact, we weren't even successful in making ourselves uh, use it as, as a key input, because the problem is it was not interpretable. It's, it's really, really hard to convince someone, persuade someone to put money on the line as a portfolio manager. You're a fiduciary. 
um, uh, life insurance company, you're a fiduciary. Um, if you don't, if you can't un understand and explain why a model says something, it's not going to be that valuable. And that's one thing that's that's a little bit. Un it's not necessarily unique to finance, but it's definitely uh, particular to finance. If you look at some of the arenas where machine learning and AI has really, really made, made progress. Uh, if you think about Netflix recommending you, you might also like this one. No one's going to ask, wait, why do you recommend that one? Or facial recognition. Why, do, why are you saying that's my face? Well, it is your face. Like, it's just... But don't and, you think uh, where, that's where catching I, up? I mean, I, it is catching up. And it's catching working, up to we're those guys, it, right? So. Because they were like, nobody cares. No one's checking. Why, who, why am I getting this ad? Well, all of a sudden now, people yeah, are asking. To them too. Even, even in tech, they're, yeah. they're going to have to explain. The search engine uh, ranking is, go, is really under, yeah. under microscope now. But, but so the search for, inter in terms of how do we alleviate it, the search for interpretable AI. And in our research, what we've found is that neural networks, we often ran comparisons where we predicted using neural networks, more deep learning, multi-layered perceptrons, comparing that to tree-based algorithms and then traditional ones, often we have actually found that neural networks couldn't be tree-based algorithms. Tree-based algorithms, for instance, like random forest, is something that sort of sits in the middle in terms of complexity and is exactly interpretable. So, so we're, we're working on putting tools together that actually allow you to decompose why is it saying what it's saying, because without that, not going to be that successful. This, this nicely leads to another question, uh, which is Google, Amazon, Facebook, all these you know, big guys, uh, big elephants, I would say. Uh, are they going to be, are they representing any threats to you know, your firm or Fidelity? Um, are these guys going to disrupt further uh, investment management world? Um, and we'd like to talk about NLP as well, uh, in Neuro. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so so mm -hmm. I think uh, I probably don't see them as a threat in the sense that they, they will start a, a bank or a hedge fund and then take over what we do, you know, because I think uh, there is value in kind of, you know, us being in finance, having a financial background and understanding the market because, you know, as I just said, you know, let's say our market, the data is very, very noisy, you know, it, it, whereas machine learning, deep learning techniques that develops for data that's relatively has, has a you know, low noise, high signal. So, you know, when they come into our arena, if they were to attempt anything, and, you know, I've actually seen some you know, examples of that. Some, some people have tried it, and, you know, they produce something that has a hit ratio of 65% or sometimes even 90%. And I looked at that research, I already know that, okay, there's something wrong in your research, you know. So, so I would say that it's definitely more kind of productive if you were to have someone, you know, that with a good understanding of financial markets to guide that, you know, AI machine learning research than someone just coming in completely without any background and just say, okay, you know, I'm going to disrupt this market by implementing some kind of LSTM or, you know, whatever fancy neural network model there is, you know, just from experience. And I think, as you guys have said, you, tr you tried implementing very complicated models. They may not beat, you know, very simple models. And why is that? You know, I think it's because, number one, you know, these algorithms, you cannot just plug and play, just you know, take it out of the box and apply in the financial markets directly and expect it to increase your you know, return by 30%, because if that can be done, then everybody would have done it, okay? And secondly, you know, I think it really requires you know, a lot of thoughtfulness in designing a model um, and the understanding of the model before applying it to you know, financial applications, you know, because the cost of getting it wrong can be so high and you know, interpretability is so important. So, you know, I think if, if you know, someone is thoughtful in implementing a machine learning model, right, and have the understanding of financial markets, the internal mechanics, I think, you know, it can be successful as opposed to just, okay, I have, a lib I have you know, 10 libraries, Python code, and then you just apply blindly onto my data. I would, I would actually okay. disagree. They, only because like, all the data out there is with Facebook, Google, and Amazon. They have all the data. They don't have to sell it to people. They could keep it and run models off of it, but they have more data than anyone else out there. Now, I, I've actually met quant funds trying to start, and they worked at one of those places. And I go, I go well, why should I invest with you coming out of one of these shops when, I, when it's better to invest in the actual firm itself if they were running a, a quant model? And, and one of them told me, um, actually both of them told me, kind of quietly, and I don't, I don't think they'll ever verify, but one of them was, uh, was forecasting out um, political outcomes. And um, they, they were using the data that they had, which is not out there in the world. And they said that they realized that, they're trying to sell it, but they realized that they could actually make more money 
turning that model to predict political outcomes into a uh, financial model that trades securities. And they specifically trade consumer securities because that's what, most pre that's what they have the most predict predictive capability with given the data. So they said they, the, one, of those, one of those firms has a little glass bowl and it's a secret room where these guys basically run quant models and manage the cash for those firms. And they have the data and they run it, but I mean, they're never gonna talk about it. But the biggest fear when you talk to Two Sigma Renaissance and Dia Shah is, is one of those guys basically running a financial model because they could take over the world. They have the, they have the, they have the resources, they have the technology, and they have the data, which is the most important. They have the data which no one else can get. They don't have to sell, they could keep it, and they have the data. So I think that is the biggest fear. So I would, I would actually disagree, but I've talked to a few guys who work at those shops who have actually created them. Going back to, uh, let's talk about open source. Give me, you know, give me some indications to the, pub, uh, yeah. to, to the audience what open source is, is okay. define it a little bit. Some of them are not, you know, kind sure. of on that level. Well, and, and actually to, to just tie up on, I sort of think it sort of segues into talking about open source. So I agree, I think we, sh we should be scared of those, uh, those sort of big, big three, four, five internet companies. They can kind of do whatever they want. Um, and if they come after what we're doing, I think they, they can do it, frankly, because I think they can hire. Now, it's, it's interesting that they haven't yet, and actually almost like a little insulting, because um, I think they're like, hey, look, we're making so much money over here selling ads to you guys. We'll get to that later. I think healthcare is something, obviously, that they're further they're out on, there, yeah. right? So they're going there. Um, so, so they have all the data. They also have all the talent. Right, so that's the other thing. I did um, a talk for uh, up, up in Boston where I was sort of saying, hey, what can we observe about uh, investment, talent, and use cases? And is AI gonna come and have an impact on financial services broadly, not just sort of investment? And that's the thing, if you look at where, you know, if you believe the publication record is any sort of a proxy for where the frontline talent is, um, you know, it's all at Google, way more than even at, uh, in academia. And friends of mine who are um, very credible in the machine learning and AI space in academia have been bemoaning reverse brain drain from academia to Google, right? Um, and they have started publishing, so that's better than nothing. But so I think we should definitely be aware that they've got all the data and the preponderance of the talent and keep that, uh, keep that. Now, what's interesting then is how does that play with this other force you see that helped drive the internet, which is open source software development? Um, so the phenomenon there, I think I would roughly summarize as you know, you've got all the AI talent, but you've also got another sort of dimension, which is all the top developer talent. And we have had an interesting shift in sort of the way that folks think about their careers in computer science and development. And it's much more about having your sort of personal work record on open source software available on GitHub. Your personal brand, you're much more of a free agent. It's a very like mercenary way of operating. So these tech companies, as you see, have to pay these guys like crazy to keep them because they all know their value on the open market. And it's a real, um, very competitive, very expensive race for talent that's also impacting us. Um, so I think open source has been a big driver of um, innovation and pushing things forward. It allows for collaboration. Um, and, and it's something that was really behind Quantopian being able to get up and running. Um, so I think it's impactful. I don't have any like really sage predictions of you know, what that intersection of open source and AI means. I think you see Google uh, using it really strategically where they'll open source toolkits to get everybody on their way of thinking and running things, and I think there are other benefits for them there. Um, and I also see financial services firms sort of trying to figure out how to catch up. They want to use those open source um, packages. They are using them, and then there are challenges that they run into. So actually, I would be curious, like if you guys use open source tools and what challenges, because I've seen there are challenges at Fidelity, yet I think it's pretty impressive that folks are using these tools and figuring out how to de-risk it. Um, but I don't know, I, I think that's pretty broad spread. From a quant researcher's perspective, I would say open source definitely, the open source revolution is uh, enormously beneficial and it's making us all more productive. Uh, the knowledge sharing that's inherent in it. Uh, but of course, it raised some challenges too. If you might not necessarily have the right structure in that open source package, uh, the way in which it cross validates uh, your analysis uh, when, you, when you're testing whether your model is robust might not be exactly something that fits your use case, might be it, it likely will be fit the use case of some, someone who works at Google who has a different kind of, uh, of data set where it's much easier to isolate causality and do A-B testing and, and those kinds of things. So uh, the particular in the area of cross-validation, uh, that, that, that can be an issue. But, 
I saw the one of the guys who's the scikit learn like maintainer saying bemoaning that the most used functionality was the train test split <laughs> and like here's all this like really he feels intelligent work's gonna do scikit learn and just the like how to slice your data in two pieces is the most exactly. used exactly. most used and most discussed I feature. think we need a little movie on this right futuristic movie about investment management how is this going to be replaced lots of people but you you're very skeptical still um, so I'm always skeptical <laughs> but I well do, you have I to be with you get paid to be skeptical right yeah that's what we, I mean look if, if if AI was working 75% of the time we wouldn't have jobs and, and I've read books about we would the not have this discussion too right well, there's a, there's a book called The Future of Life. It talks about AI basically taking over the world at some point because humans will die out at some point, you know, whatever, a million years from now. AI could be that it's if, the matrix. It, if it was uh, created. But there's a book called, the, I think it's The Future of Life that talks about that. But I do agree that um, open source is a, better, is a better way to do things. It's more robust and it's better. But within financial services, if you talk to the big guys, they never talk about their models. They don't talk about how they solve multi-time horizon optimization. They don't talk about any of this stuff because it's all proprietary. Because if you lose that to everyone else, you're basically, your model is done. Where open source, I think, is fascinating and most helpful is in cyber. So, so within cyber, you get more robust solutions if you have more people working on it and stuff. And I think, I think that's an area where open source is extremely helpful and it's helpful for the whole world. Because uh, like, it's interesting with cyber is that um, Cyber is like a weapon that can, it can really take out the world, but, and there's no rules on it. So I think I was talking to some NSA guys, and um, so there's rules on nuclear warfare. Like you can't push the button basically. In cyber there are no rules, and you could take out the banking system, you could take out the utility grid. So within, within cyber I think it's more important to have more robust things that people can share, but op an open source will create a more robust cyber you know, protection within our, within our world. Three more minutes, four minutes. So your brief uh, analysis where we're going to go in the next, uh, you know, two years, let's say. Uh, yeah, yeah. What, what pitfalls do you see in front of us, uh, some challenges and opportunities? Yeah, so I think right now, you know, a lot of people do AI or machine learning or they claim to do so. What do they do? They, they take, you know, let's say, as I just described, you know, all the libraries in Python, apply it to, the, to you know, as much data as I can find and then, you know, uh, use some kind of cross-validation technique and say, hey, you know what, this one gives me the highest sharp ratio or whatever performance metrics you use, right? So I think, you know, 90% of the research I've read or studies I've seen are, you know, something like that. But I would say that in two years from now, you know, people will realize that, well, actually, you know, these kind of analysis, they don't really add that much value because, you know, you've just basically repeated, uh, you know, the same tasks again, you know, like a hundred times and then just statistically maybe, you know, five algorithms out of them will give you amazing results. You know, I think what really is uh, going to be, um, more highly valued in two years' time is, okay, as you said, can you interpret the model? Why does it work, right? Like, uh, what kind of uh, information can we take out of the model besides just the signal it produces? You know, does it tell us more about, okay, the behavior, the data, and, you know, things like that? So I would say uh, in two years' time, like, uh, the way we do AI research is going to be very different in the sense that it will involve much, much more, actually, you know, ironically human element than, than it does now. Go ahead, if you have any uh, more thoughts. Uh, on AI machine learning? I, 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 think, I, I think I'm good, actually. Well, your, your closing remarks and uh, Jessica. It, it's, it's not, I wouldn't call it a revolution, it's an evolution. Uh, I think it's still a relatively small percentage uh, of uh, quantitative researchers and, and portfolio managers that are using machine learning uh, today. I think over the next two to three years, that number is gonna grow very rapidly internally in New York Life, we have a data science academy. Uh, it, it's both a business track and a technical track, but just upgrading skills, but open, opening people's minds. People who have the aptitude for quantitative methods already uh, can benefit greatly from, from learning next generation methods. Uh, and with that, there's gonna be better tools for screening and monitoring better tools for identifying key predictors. Uh, and that's gonna, once that starts permeating the industry, and that's still gonna take some time, but then it's gonna lead to a lot of efficiencies. Okay. And Jessica. So I think the thought I'd leave with is, we are all very interested in improving the investment process, and that's often sort of the, the most fun, the highest you know, ROI personally if you're working on it. Um, it's just fun to talk about, but I think you know, moving from a, 
a small uh, you know, asset management or sort of startup to a large, large asset manager has caused me to think about with a little broader lens on financial services broadly. And I think if you roll the clock forward, what you'll see, you know, elephant in the room in financial services is fee compression, right? And we're all trying to be more efficient. And I think that's where you're going to see first the impacts of AI and machine learning is in other parts of the sort of consumer facing solution. I've been blown away by some of the like chatbot and voice print and automation that's happening sort of all in the customer service side of things. So the next five years, I think we'll continue to see a lot more humans interfacing with ML and AI in their yeah. daily lives, but not appreciably, you know, but much less impacts in that, you know, that peak sort of really, really investment decision part of the workflow will, will be a lot, a lot longer to, to fall. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, well, round of applause for a great panelist. And uh, we continue. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Any, any, any questions? Everything I, I, okay? I Everything have a question. Clear? I want to ask a question. Okay. All right. yeah. One more question. <laughs> well, uh, it's it said on a, on, a, on a consumer level, there is this um, uh, sentiment that uh, people buy on emotions and justify with logic. So in the investment world or uh, asset management world, so how do you, for example, put this together when your in internal feeling, your gut basically tells you that you shouldn't do this or shouldn't do that, and artificial intelligence or the data uh, is completely opposite of that. So w how would you base your decision then uh, on, on, on uh, your internal feeling is that you shouldn't go there and artificial intelligence tells you otherwise? I, I, it's funny, I, I'm actually a psychologist too. The, um, when, you look at, um, when you look at people, people respond differently than how they behave. So it doesn't matter what, what people are, are thinking, what they tell you, because what the, how they behave may be different than what they're saying. The, um, I mean, without quant models, you're trying to, markets, are, markets, I would say, are irrational for the most part. Over time, they may become rational, but markets are irrational at any one point in time. And if with every quant model, you're trying to predict that ir irrationality, like the seasonality effect or the end of the month effect or some kind of effect. The, um, with AI, you're trying to recognize those patterns too. The problem with AI is, it recognizes the pattern, it's pattern recognition, but you can't explain what the pattern is. So if the pattern disappears because markets are systemically changing, then you can't turn off that model. Like right now, we, so we used to have 8,000 stocks, we only have 4,000 stocks now. The, um, you know, we, have more, you know, we have more quants trading now than there used to be, there's fewer retail people. Like the markets itself are systemically changing. And with an, with an AI machine learning model, the problem is you, there's no narrative on why it was working, what it was predicting, that you can't turn it off. I think that's, that's the bigger problem. And it's great at explaining history. It's great, it's great in a back test, but going forward, it may not be the case as people change. Thank you, uh, Val. So one, sorry, one thing to add is just uh, I think the short term, like let's say if we're forecasting a one-month volatility, for example, I tried a lot of uh, different fundamental variables, and none of it works. It's purely technical, okay? And therefore, I think AI machine learning works really well there. But if you were to forecast say 12-month returns, for example, then that's where the fundamentals come in. So I would say that depending on what kind of frequency you're looking at, sometimes you just have to go with the machines because, as you said, it's not rational, okay? But in the longer term, you know, rationality kicks in, and therefore you need kind of the more you know, fundamental aspects, basically. I learned yesterday that also emotions are supposedly quantifiable. So can that be worked into the prediction models? I mean, I think there you get into why folks think that sentiment works, right? So they say, and this maybe works with, you know, stocks that everyone likes to talk about on Twitter. I know when I was looking at Estimize's data, um, you know, they've got like a hundred times, I don't know if you're familiar with Estimize, crowdsources, estimates, but they've got like a hundred or a thousand times more folks covering Apple, right, than some boring um, utility. So I think, yeah, like in the short term, you know, right, so sort of short term voting machine, long term weighing machine, people's emotions and predictions and thoughts about what are gonna happen definitely drive markets. Um, the trick is, you know, exactly being able, like this multi-period optimization problem, like over what time scale will the emotion continue to drive before mm -hmm. there'll be some comeuppance, right? And so the more liquid markets, the faster that happens. I think a great example, you know, that's been talked about a lot, but I, it's still too fun to not mention it is, what if you aren't sort of sampling the markets that often? Then I think that's where you get your private bubble we work situations, right? So there it's like all emotion, want it to work, want it to work, want it to work. Um, that could carry on for a really long time. So predicting when it tips from emotion to rationality is a really challenging problem. And I, I did see an interesting quant model where they were actually 
they had exclusive access to like TD and all these other guys that, that trade Charles Schwab and stuff. And they were asking the, the clients there to, to give their view on a stock, positive or negative, while they're, while they're trading. And I, I, I was asking them, like, how does the model work and stuff? Like, what if, what if, the, uh, what if the customer, the retail customer is wrong in his view? So he says, we don't actually buy when they actually recommend the stock. We may actually trade the opposite. So what, like, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. But what, pe like what I was saying earlier is that what people say, they're, what the people believe in may actually go against them, that these guys are actually short the stuff that people want to be long. And it actually makes money. I, the question is, I don't know how scalable it is. And I don't know, as they raise more money, will it continue to work? I don't know the answer to it. And I told them that's the biggest question. Uh, scalability is the biggest question. Let's uh, end here. And thank you very much for the panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.